Yeah, this is Billiam. Back to Ben 10. The original Ben 10 series was this exciting blockbuster style superhero cartoon starring 10 year old Ben Tennyson, his cousin Gwen, and their grandpa Max as they travel cross country on a summer road trip, during which Ben discovers an alien device which straps itself to his wrist like a watch, giving him the power to transform into 10 different super powered aliens. And then a whole lot more aliens, including Cannonball, Stocky. The device called the Omnitrix is super powerful, putting the gang in the cross hairs of all kinds of aliens, getting them into trouble while they're just trying to enjoy the summer. Revisiting the original Ben 10, it's great fun to watch and its excellent action direction gives it a really cinematic feeling that wasn't really present in a lot of cartoons at the time. But while I liked Ben 10 a lot, growing up, I really started getting into it more with its sequel series. With its inferior theme song, like why did you get rid of the lyrics? The original theme song was such a little funky, like great little jam. This is just like boring cinematicness and I, yeah, it's well done, but like, ugh. With its entirely inferior theme song, Ben 10 Alien Force takes place five years after the original and stars 15 year old Ben 10, who after years of living normally needs to put the Omnitrix back on to uncover and stop an alien conspiracy on earth, which is connected with the disappearance of his grandpa Max. Ben, his cousin Gwen, and enemy turned ally Kevin Ethan Levin, Kevin Eleven, team up to track down Grandpa Max and uncover the plot of the DN aliens, who in true classic sci-fi action have the power to disguise themselves as anyone, a la Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Ben 10 Alien Force loses a lot of the charm of the original series. The original series had that grandparent grandkids dynamic that was really wholesome, but in a lot of ways, Ben 10 Alien Force is leagues better than the original show. But in a lot of other ways, it's the same exact show, just with a different cast and setting. So, back to Ben 10. Hey, let me just take a moment to thank today's sponsor, ExpressVPN. A VPN is a virtual private network. Essentially, it adds a layer of security between your device and the internet, keeping your browsing habits private from your ISP and creating an extra layer of security against hacking risks. And using the internet without ExpressVPN is like going to the bathroom with the door wide open. It's questionable if you do it in your your home with your roommates around, but it's very concerning if you do it in the public bathroom at Starbucks while using the public Wi-Fi. Close that door and get ExpressVPN. <laughs> One of the coolest things about VPN is being able to reroute your connection to a server in another country, which fools websites into thinking you're in that country, getting you around geographically restricted content. All right, Netflix, they're like, we don't have South Park, we don't have Rick and Morty, we don't got Studio Ghibli films, and unless you're in the UK, and check this out. ExpressVPN lets you lie right to Netflix's face. Check it out. Spirited away no more. It's spirited right here. Hey, Netflix, if, if I were to look out that window, I would see England, Scotland, Wales, maybe Northern Ireland, who knows? <laughs> I'm not letting you look, though. ExpressVPN is the number one top-rated VPN provider. Says who? Well, says Tech Radar. To the Verge, me, and don't blink now. Watch how fast it is for me to connect in the app. Boom. Connected right in front of your eyes like that. So if you're interested, go to expressvpn.com slash billium to find out how you can get three months free. And thank you. Thank you, ExpressVPN, for both of the offer and sponsoring this video. Ben 10 was a breakout hit for Cartoon Network, but after the original run of episodes, along with an extra season, Cartoon Network wanted to take the show in new directions. They wanted to age Ben and Gwen up a few years and have Kevin from the original show join their team. Cartoon Network had tapped veteran comic book show writer Glenn Murakami, who asked his frequent collaborator Dwayne McDuffie help revamp the franchise. Murakami had created Batman Beyond, and McDuffie had created the character Static alongside the cartoon Static Shock and the comic book company who writes the stories for the character Milestone Media. Now, despite airing its Ken canonical finale in August of 2007, Ben 10 had an extra season ordered that takes place before the finale. So the final broadcast episode of Ben 10 was aired on April 15th, 2008, with the first episode of Alien Force airing three days later on April 18th. I was really hyped for the show. The finale to Ben 10, The Secret of the Omnitrix, left the solar system and really expanded the horizons for the Ben 10 universe. 
it felt like there was so much more of this world to explore and it's always exciting to see Ben you know learn how to use the Omnitrix more and get new aliens and become more powerful and Alien Force just came out at a great time for the original show's maturing audience at this point I was now much closer in age to 15 year old Ben than 10 year old Ben and while I don't necessarily think they had exhausted all of the story potential of the original series I do think it was a good transition for the show to make at the time though I do know not everyone would agree with this statement. Well Murakami and McDuffie had a vision of Alien Force being like the X-Files meets Scooby-Doo with a darker story and underlying mystery. There is always push and pull between them and the network to make it a lot more poppy like the original show. In the first episode Ben and Gwen discover Grandpa has gone off to investigate an alien conspiracy being enacted by these creepy aliens. They're up to something. Instructed by a cryptic message left by Grandpa Max, Ben digs up the Omnitrix which he hasn't worn for five years and meets up with Gwen. The two are confronted by Magister Labrid, a member of the Plumbers, an intergalactic police force Grandpa used to be a part of. Labrid's the only plumber who believes Grandpa Max was on to something, and together the three of them investigate a tip of an illegal dealing in alien weaponry happening between a criminal organization and Kevin Levin, who has been making a name for himself in the alien criminal underworld. The group he's dealing to, the Forever Knights, leave before Kevin can get his money, so the four of them briefly team up to track down the buyers. Gwen uses her powers to track down where Kevin originally got the weapons from, and they discover a secret alien base where they're building something which can only be assumed to be no good. They successfully destroy the base, but we learn that this is just one of many hideouts of the DN aliens, who are secretly collecting alien technology to build something which can only be described as nefarious. Magister Labrid dies in combat and gives Kevin his plumber's badge, which seems to mean a lot to him. Kevin agrees to join the team Ben is building at the request of Grandpa Max for the impending trouble. Ben 10 is back. Ten-year-old Ben and Gwen were always bickering, mostly because Ben would stir up trouble, but they were balanced by the sweet and patient Grandpa Max. But with the main cast being made up of all teenagers, the dynamics are a lot different, but they play off of each other so well. Like, I love these three in Alien Force for a different reasons that I love these three in the original Ben 10. A few years older now, Ben still has confidence, but he's a little more unsure of himself because Grandpa Max, his mentor, is not around. And save your planet. I can't do it without Grandpa. I don't know how. There's a lot more responsibility on his shoulders to make decisions. I mean, this little f***er was just the worst in the original show. We see the seeds of Grandpa's lessons being planted in him to respect others, value teamwork, doing the right thing for the sake of doing the right thing. However, Ben would pretty much never internalize these lessons learned at the end of every episode. The lessons were more there for the episodic story to have a theme. But in Alien Force, we can see he's starting to internalize these lessons and really starting to go down the path of becoming the kind of character I would like to see him become. I mean, he still has a long way to go. He can definitely still be a major jerk. But I mean, I wouldn't like Ben 10 if I didn't want to punch him in the face occasionally. But he does understand the importance of being kind to people he cares about. Baby steps Ben Tennyson. Ben is now an experienced hero who's able to learn and adapt very quickly, but the Omnitrix has updated and reset itself. I never did that before. Restricting Ben's transformations to a new set of 10 aliens. I don't recognize any of these guys. Update. Instead of a strict 10 minute time limit between each transformation, the Omnitrix now holds a small charge. So Ben can actually transform a couple of times before it loses power. Also, there's voice command, but Ben doesn't really use it because he's not used to it. Really, the only thing I liked more about the original series was the aliens. But now I appreciate how the aliens and alien force are slightly more complicated than the originals. They all have more tools in their arsenal, which makes the action more exciting. Accelerate could run fast and also had wheels for feet for more speed. But now his fast alien is Jet Ray, a manta ray kind of thing who also flies and shoots lasers. A lot of the newer aliens sort of fit the archetypal roles of the alien transformations in the original series, so they're familiar but also really fresh at the same time. Take Swamp Fire, who can shoot fire like Heat Blast, but is also made of plant material like Wild Vine. Swamp Fire gets f***ed up and brutalized in all sorts of crazy ways. Uh, but then it's okay because he just grows it all back. There's the ghostly Big Chill, or as I like to call him, Mothman. He can shoot ice and freeze anything it passes through. I love how elegant and magical girl the transformations are. But oh, Ben's got big ribs. Who's this? Uh, it's... You. 
Humongosaur! It's Humongosaur, who can shrink and grow to different sizes. Um, there's Brainstorm, a hyper-intelligent robot with a big brain that can shock people. There's Spider Monkey, a monkey with multiple arms who can shoot webs from his, like, you know what I can assume is a bright red baboon ass. There's Echo Echo who can like multiply himself and scream loudly. Chromastone who's made of crystal but can also absorb and redirect all sorts of rays, energy, light, and other miscellaneous sci-fi attacks. And then there's Alien X, a curious creature whose powers may only be described as actually God. But in order to act as Alien X, in order to do anything, Ben must first hold a debate from within the dark recesses of Alien X's mind. With two ethereal beings, the voice of rage and the voice of love, who, with Ben, who takes on the role of the voice of reason, must come to a vote before Alien X takes any action. A safeguard which stands in place against taking careless actions as the universe's most powerful species. And Goop! <laughs> we like Goop here. He's like controlled by this little UFO. It's a goo controller. Gwen is often more cool headed than Ben. She has gotten more proficient in her magic usage over the years and is both an accomplished gymnast and martial artist. Gwen is definitely the most intelligent one on the team and her magic allows them to track down the owner of anything they come in contact with, which comes in handy for their investigative work. She goes to a prep school, a different school than Ben, and she's definitely the most intelligent one on the team and brings a level of caring and understanding to the personal stakes of their mission in relation to who they're helping, which is something often missed by both Ben and Kevin. And while Kevin is still really sharp around the edges, it's Gwen's kindness that ultimately motivates Kevin to join up with them, amongst other things. You're going to tell me where they are. Kevin, people could be hurt. While the tennis and children used to be balanced by the kind, sweet, patient, and caring Grandpa Max, now they're balanced by the certified rude boy, Kevin Eleven. We're still going the same speed. It's called the speed limit. Fast as we're going tonight. My mom's going to kill me if I'm late getting home again. Huh. If she grounds you, it'll be just me and Gwen. Tough break. But actually, Kevin is the best character in Ben 10 Alien Force, and he's an essential balance to these newer versions of Ben and Gwen. Kevin was like a really unlikable character in the original show. Like Ben, he also had powers, but unlike Ben, he had no mentor figure like Grandpa Max. So initially, he sort of acts as a bad influence for Ben to show how Ben could use his powers for evil. He has the power to absorb energy and matter, like he'll touch stone or metal and get an outer coat of the material, but he needs a lot of it to use it, so there are some limitations. In Ben 10, the original series, Kevin's powers are overloaded by the Omnitrix, and Kevin mutates into this horrific combination of all of Ben's transformations. From there, he's just a whiny sad boy who's self-conscious and thinks everyone hates him for being a freak. He's half right, but from this picture, I couldn't really tell you which half. Five years later, Kevin has learned a lot about the shady side of the alien world and has worked out a lot, like, oh my god. There's a moment in the second half of the pilot episode that I really like. Ben is stressed about the fact that Grandpa is missing and he lashes out at Gwen, which is something she really doesn't deserve. Don't talk to her like that. I'll talk to her anyway, I... You're right. I'm sorry, Gwen. My jaw dropped when I saw this. This is right after new Kevin is introduced and I cannot think of a better way to make him likable than for him to put bratty little Ben in his place. Like Ben is embarrassed by his behavior because of Kevin. If I'm going to be a good leader, I'm going to need to show better judgment. If you're gonna be a good leader, you need to stop sounding like such a jerk. Kevin. He's right. I'm a jerk. While Kevin does soften up a little bit, he always remains as Kevin, which is why I like him as a character so much. Isn't that like a big bad boy thing to do? Come out here to the ghost town to drag race? How should I know? I just know them from auto shop. He's still a shady guy looking to make some money on the side, and he's still very self-conscious at heart and has trouble openly caring for people. Ben and Gwen now sort of act as a moral center to the group, and they often have to argue with Kevin that doing the right thing is important. And early on, they have to learn to trust him. I mean, he breaks apart Grandpa's RV to sell it for spare parts, and he often has these gray hero moments where he reminds the audience there's still a little degen in him. In this scene, they just stopped a bunch of bad guys from using a lot of expensive 
alien technology. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm gonna go swipe some of their equipment. Kevin! I love how this episode just ends. I am conditioned to think that Kevin's gonna be like, just kidding, I've changed, I'm a good guy now. But now he just walks off to go do what he said he was going to do. The show very frequently shows us and puts a focus on how all three of these characters react and respond differently to the same situation. Not taking advantage of the spoils and rewards of being a hero was a very specific lesson Grandpa taught Ben and Gwen in the original show. Of course, from Kevin's perspective, there is absolutely nothing wrong with stealing from the bad guys. Which is just good, attentive character writing. I particularly like this one episode where Gwen kind of instructs Ben to use his head for thinking. Headbutt! Not that way. The other way. What other way? But then at the end of the episode, Ben kind of thinks things through and succeeds in the plan. I used my head. Headbutt, huh? An old one, but it always works. You're really coming along, kid. Thanks, Kevin. I love how his acknowledgement of Ben's personal growth works here, but he's just on the same page as Ben was earlier in the episode. But besides the characters, there's also a change in format as well. Ben 10 is really no longer a road trip show. Most of it takes place in their hometown of Bellwood. A lot of the original Ben 10 saw the characters often stumbling into action by accident while on their road trip. In Alien Force, the team has a mission to uncover and stop the plot of the DN aliens. So with their investigative tools and skills, there's usually a more active approach to finding the action. That's your plumber's badge. What's it doing? Don't know. New to me. So often episodes will start in the middle of a mission and then each individual story will kind of spin off from there. There is this overarching serialized plot, but the quality of each individual episode is what the show prioritizes, which I think is a good thing. Being set in their hometown, more focus is placed on the characters balancing their double lives of being a team of superheroes and being in high school with regular high school student worries. There's a lot of teen drama elements in the series, which admittedly I do not mind. There's quite a few episodes that feel like they could be right out of Buffy or Smallville. Ben stands up to cash the bully who then wrecks Kevin's car and finds a high-tech gauntlet which makes him go mad with strength and power. The plumber's badge leads them to meet several alien-powered kids, including Alan Albright, who has recently discovered his powers and is being blamed by the police for problems the DNA aliens are responsible for. There's also Michael Morningstar, who lures high school girls onto dates and then to his house to drain them of their energy. Yeah, Gwen fucks him up big time. Mr. Smoothies is the teen hangout place here in Bellwood. Ben is always drinking a smoothie, which for a high schooler with no job, he, he sure could afford a lot of like smoothies. Those things are like six bucks usually. Holy shit, Ben. So much takes place in this parking lot and Mr. Smoothies is constantly getting destroyed. They must have amazing insurance. You know, if I noticed that this kid in the green jacket was coming to my store every single time before it got destroyed, I might say, hey, you're not welcome back here. No juice for you. We learn more about the Tennyson family. Grandpa Max seemingly sacrifices himself to defeat a group of DN aliens, which the gang seems to not be too broken up about, huh? That was pretty hardcore. Grandpa Max isn't actually dead. A massive explosion! The rumor of his death spreads throughout the galaxy, which is when we also learn more about Grandpa's extracurricular, extrasexual, extraterrestrial exploits. Turns out Gwen has magic powers, or at least she has more magic powers, because Ben and Gwen's grandma was also an alien, a different alien that Grandpa Max brought into the rust bucket in the first show. Humans with alien ancestors are actually pretty common. Most of them have superpowers. Common? Well, yeah, that's what you are. Uh, I get my powers from magic talismans and books. <laughs> yeah, right. Their grandmother is Verdona, an energy being. I like how the episode is told from the perspective of Gwen's family, and we can tell they have a very strained relationship with her. Verdona, what a surprise. She tries to bring Gwen back to their home planet made of energy and even tries to take her by force. She's a lot of fun as an antagonist in this episode and they all try to fight her off to protect Gwen and in this weird way, she really enjoys this as spending time with her grandkids who she's never met before. Dude, I don't know if I can pound your grandma. That's okay. We're teaching her to mind her mana. <laughs> Good one, Ben. But she backs off once Gwen stands up to her. Initially, Ben and Gwen have to sneak around and schedule missions around school. There's an episode where Ben's parents find out he's a superhero and they ground him and call Gwen's parents who ground her. This leaves Kevin alone for a mission. 
Now that these characters are a little older, we also start seeing a bit of their blossoming romantic lives. Kevin and Gwen are really fun to watch. Follow me! Kevin is not a romantic or affectionate, but he definitely likes Gwen and Gwen likes him. I follow you anywhere. Gwen is much more assertive than Kevin, which can sometimes make Kevin a bit uneasy. Problem? Why haven't you asked me out? What? But it's hilarious because often he tries to act like such a badass, but he falls apart instantly when this topic comes up. It's great. Ben ends up dating a girl named Julie. On their first date, this little alien creature who can take over technology starts wrecking havoc. Ben eventually has to reveal his identity as an alien hero. You're a monster? Uh, no. Well, uh, yes. Actually, I'm like 10 monsters. Cool. But it turns out the creature is just trying to get their help. And at the end of the episode, she decides to keep it. Their name is Ship, and Julie and Ship make a really fun team, and often she ends up joining along the missions as well. I like how Alien Force handles its relationships. It's always fun, and the characters are so well written that it's really just fun seeing them interact in all these new situations. There's a great episode where Ben starts blacking out whenever he transforms into an alien. He learns that the ghostly Big Chill is acting on its own whenever he transforms. So Julie follows him around to learn what he's up to while he's blacked out. It's like going around eating metal and stuff, it's weird. Meanwhile, Gwen asks Kevin to take her to a formal dance at her prep school. Hey! What? Oh, look, they're having a formal dance at my school on Friday. What, you want me to take you to the dance? Great, pick me up at seven. What? And this is just like so out of Kevin's wheelhouse. Kevin goes and asks Ben for advice about Gwen. Uh huh. What do you know about girls? But meanwhile, Julie is trying to ask Gwen for help and advice on how to deal with the whole Ben situation, but she really doesn't know how to describe what's going on. Gwen is preoccupied with thinking Kevin is going to bail on the dance, but Kevin is just worried he won't be able to compete with all of the guys at her prep school. So it's nice to see this progression of them being open with each other. And now bada bing, bada boom, that's Grandpa Max's tux. There, don't you look dapper. And I think the thing that I really like about this show's attention to detail is this tux would not fit Ben. Grandpa Max wasn't the skinniest guy out there. It's from when he was younger. Grandpa Max even told Kevin in an earlier episode that he was proud of him. You're a nice corsage. It's like this little piece of Grandpa Max that could only be given to Kevin. And it seems to mean a lot to him. It's really sweet. Wanna dance? What's a corsage? Julie is finally able to get Gwen and Kevin's attention right before the dance, so they decide not to go, which really bums Kevin out. He ends up wanting to go to the dance. I knew it! You're embarrassed to go with me. No, it's just that I think Ben might be in some kind of trouble. What makes you say that? However, this is urgent because it seems like Big Chill is going to do something <laughs> A callback to the original show's transformation, Ghost Freak, who came out of Ben's watch and turned evil. Stay away from there! But that's not the situation at all. Yeah, Ben 10 was f***ing pregnant. <laughs> this is the most embarrassing. I think you made a great mommy. And at the end of the episode, Kevin and Gwen have their own little private dance with music playing over Kevin's car radio. It's this really nice moment. Kevin's arc is about him realizing Gwen likes him for who he is. And it's nice to see them share this just, you know, nice moment together. Although the series definitely prioritizes the quality of each individual episode, its serialized elements are a lot more complicated than the original show. When I was younger, I did not like the DN aliens. I thought Vilgax was a much more interesting villain. I mean, in many ways, the DN alien hybrids are just another very tall, strong villain like Vilgax. But I think the reason why I preferred Vilgax more as a younger kid is because all of Vilgax's episodes in the original show are really self-contained. I mean, they do hype him up before he finally shows up. But if you saw an episode with Vilgax, you immediately knew he was a serious villain. I did not watch every single episode of Ben 10 Alien Force as a kid, and I did not see the entire series in order. And now having seen the series in its proper order sequentially, and all of the missing episodes that I had yet to see, I really like the hybrid as villains. The mystery about the objective of the DN aliens and how they're doing what they're doing is really fun to unravel. We learned the DN 
and aliens prefer the cold, so they create these huge weather machines, which are masked by the same technology they use for their disguises. The DN alien leaders, the hybrids, are some of the oldest aliens in the galaxy and are huge racists. They're collecting all of this technology for a huge project. And the big twist to all of it, that all of the DN alien underlings are actually humans, which have been mutated by the hybrids Xenosax, which is how they reproduce it, like attaches to their face and mutates the host, meaning all of their offspring are technically half-breeds and they're convinced the only way to preserve the integrity of their race is by blowing up the universe. And Ben finds out the Omnitrix can repair the DNA of those who have mutated into DNA aliens. There's stakes and drama to this story. Grandpa's death seemed real when it happened and he doesn't show up again for another season and a half. So the audience was left thinking that Grandpa actually died. However, he triumphantly returns with a gang of new plumber recruits and with the help of Azmuth, the creator of the Omnitrix. The Ben 10 squad learns the DNA aliens are planning to build a warp gate to invade Earth, so they team up with all of the plumber's kids and other allies to take them down. All of the kids are technically part aliens, so they're the perfect team to go up against the elite supremacist hybrid. Instead of winning by brute force, Ben thinks outside of the box and tells Azmuth the off and comes up with a peaceful solution. In an earlier episode, Ben and an alien hybrid commander, who he nicknames Rhiney, get trapped on a hostile planet. They have to work together to survive, which Ben has no issue with, but Rhiney's all like pee pee poo poo about it. Rhiney loses his arm. They can't grow arms back. When Ben replaces Rhiney's limb wound with one of Swampfire's many limbs, Rhiney feels conflicted. You really do want to try to be friends with a human. Why is Ben being nice to him? If the hybrid are so great, why can't they regrow their limbs? Rhiney decides to stay behind on the planet to work all these complicated thoughts out. When Ben faces the hybrid High Council, he finds out that the hybrid, they're all dying and they're dying out. They've been inbreeding, they're growing sterile, their bodies grow weak. So Ben uses the Omnitrix robust DNA scanning technology to patch the hybrid's DNA to give them healthy new bodies infused with the delicious taste of a bunch of alien DNA. Rhiney returns with news. Racism is bad. They let Rhiney become the new leader to bring the hybrid into a new era. A lot of the finale has to do with Ben becoming his own person apart from his mentor figures. He's only able to come to his universe saving solution by directly disobeying Azmuth. We're reminded the Omnitrix was sent for Grandpa Max, not Ben, but it's the younger people who lead to a real solution. So if it were to go to him, the universe would have been destroyed. And at the end of the episode, Grandpa admits there's nothing left he can teach Ben Evan and Gwen and goes off to train the new recruits of the plumbers. I think they need some training from an old pro. You three sure don't need me anymore. I'll always need you, Grandpa. The DNA alien arc is a true, exciting mystery, and while each individual episode is strong on its own, they pull it all together to be thematically relevant. It has focus, but the same cannot really be said about the rest. Well, here we go again. So Ben 10 Alien Force is really separated into two distinct acts. The first 26 episode is the hybrid DN Alien arc, and the next 20 episodes are about the team going on all of these exciting missions and Ben getting used to being an intergalactic hero, having gamed intergalactic notoriety for after saving the universe from the hybrids. A lot of recurring story elements are set up in the two-part first episode of season three. Bill Gax starts a revenge quest to, you know, get back at Ben, and Ben Ben tries to hack into the Omnitrix to unlock master controls like Azmuth unlocked for him during the hybrid battle, but the resulting explosion causes Azmuth to lose his trust in Ben, and Kevin ends up absorbing a bunch of energy from the Omnitrix, which gets him stuck in this mutated form, technically is Ben's fault. But despite all of this, Ben has his ego back. Right, fight to the death with Vilgax, no problem. Ben getting his ego back in full swing really makes me appreciate the second half of the show a lot. I like Ben 10 a little bit more when I kind of want to punch him in the face occasionally. At the end of the day, Ben does have a big heart and he deeply cares about people. And unlike in the original series, this isn't really something we need to be reminded of. His desire to do good is the most prevalent part of his character and his overconfidence and cockiness is just a character flaw. I feel like in the original series, it was sort of this in reverse where his overconfidence and cockiness was his most prevalent motivating factor, but his desire to do good was just sort of a redeeming quality of his. So lighten up. Have a smoothie on me. Okay. 
<laughs> and Ben definitely has his moments where I want to punch him in the face. You know, he really doesn't like ship that much. But this time around, there's also a really satisfying element to Ben's cockiness. And after having some help from Azmuth in the finale of the DNA Alien arc, he has a selection of some of his favorite aliens from the original show, which covers some of the holes in his switchblade of abilities. Hell yeah. Cannonbolt. Cannonbolt. Vilgax is a recurring villain in the second half of the show. The once powerful villain who pushed Ben, Gwen, and Grandpa to their absolute limits now sees himself in a reverse situation. Vilgax comes back and challenges Ben directly. Vilgax is just like pummeling Ben. He busts Chromastone apart, but oh, Chromastone is reforming and what's going on? Diamond Head. Oh. You're in trouble, Vilgax. I've had a lot of practice with this one. I cannot explain how hyped up I felt watching this as a kid. The return of Diamond Head is just an awesome surprise. He makes his new mission entirely about defeating Ben, having to now scheme and strategize in an attempt to get an upper hand on him. Say the word, I will. From there, he just like clowns on Vilgax. In a later episode, Vilgax gets the Omnitrix, but the voice command has it locked to Ben's voice, so he can't use it. So Ben helps him out. He turns Vilgax into goop and beats him by turning off the goo controller. It's brilliant. At one point, Vilgax's quest for power gets him into some trouble, and he even has to ask Ben, as a great hero known throughout the galaxy, for help saving his homeworld which, despite Vilgax's conquests, is largely peaceful. I had such a huge smile while watching them talk out the situation with Vilgax in the Mr. Smoothie parking lot. It's just a great way to show that, yes, Ben has grown a lot stronger since the original show. Ben helps Vilgax exclusively because he knows if Vilgax tries to double cross him, he will be able to keep him under control. It's a really satisfying position to see a character like Vilgax in. While this season or two, depending on how you split it up, has a lot of great one-off episodes, I don't think Vilgax wanting to kick Ben's ass is enough of an exciting plot to follow up the DN alien arc. Ben 10's world has always been pretty interesting. Ben's alien transformations are alien species that really exist in this environment, and it's always fun to learn more about them and see him get new aliens. But also there's this mystery laid out in the second half of the show where there seems to be a direct connection between Chromastone to Ben's older transformation, Diamond Head. We spend more time with Azmuth, the creator of the Omnitrix, including on the planet Primus, which stores the Omnitrix's vast data center of DNA samples. We also meet Albedo, who was an old assistant of Azmuth, Albedo tried to make his own knockoff Omnitrix and got stuck in Ben's body because Ben's human DNA is the human DNA stored in the Omnitrix. His version of the Omnitrix does not have the Galvin DNA he needs to get back into his own body, so he goes after Ben's original Omnitrix to transform back to normal. There's exciting and some really fun episodes from this season, but it doesn't feel like there's a goal in mind. There's serialized story elements like Chromastone and Kevin trying to get his normal form back, but the developing story in the first arc elevated the more episodic nature of Alien Force. This is just a grab bag of stories, and some are better than others. I have a lot of episodes episodes I have thoughts on, but I don't really think there's room for a miscellaneous list of Ben 10 episodes in this video. I mean, this was supposed to be less than 20 minutes. So I think I'm going to do a video on my B-side channel just discussing some of these one shots. So that'll be up soon. Go check it out. Eating babies is not Cool! I found myself really enjoying Ben 10 Alien Force. I watched like 35 episodes straight the weekend after getting my second vaccine dose. I mean, typically a lot of these shows uh, kind of feel like a chore for me to get to, but this was a breeze to get through and I really enjoyed it, which is why I was thrown off so much by this line. This is the worst show I've ever seen. This isn't the best one to start with. It's not Sumo Slammer's classic. It's Sumo Slammer's hero generation. Yeah, I don't really care. Anyway, there's only five more of these before they cycle back to the original show. While I found Ben 10 Alien Force to be a really enjoyable show, its finale is less of a conclusion to a series and more of a pilot for the next show, Ben 10 Ultimate Alien. In the final episode, Vilgax teams up with Albedo to take down Ben. Albedo has developed a new souped up version of the Omnitrix called the Ultimatrix, which can evolve and change Ben's aliens into more powerful forms. Vilgax is able to get the Omnitrix from Ben, but he uses the voice command 
controls to blow it up on Vilgax's wrist. Vilgax does not give in and takes the explosion, but he tries the same exact tactic with Albedo, who immediately gives in and gives Ben the Ultimatrix. We see Ultimate Humongosaur and Ultimate Swamp Fire, okay. Uh, Ultimate Alien has a lot of the same staff writers as Ben 10 Alien Force, and the art style remains consistent. So if you're wondering why I didn't mention some stuff in this video, like the Forever Night storyline, I will most likely mention it when I watch Ben 10 Ultimate Alien. And audience, I'm warning you, I don't want to see any comments down below like, Hey, when's the next uh, Ben 10 video coming out? Oh, are you still talking about Ben 10 in the future? What happened to the Ben 10? videos it's been one week since the last one for every comment i get like that i will delay the next ben 10 video by one month or i will just wait until i feel like doing it like i did with this one I'm not gonna make my whole life about ben 10 for three months straight it's just not gonna happen <laughs> So anyways, I'm tired, I'm stressed, I'll see you soon.